あれ、ついつ作った Hi everyone,、uh, I'm Sherman Chow from Chai Street of Hong Kong, your session chair here. We are having a session of SS Control. We have two papers on SS Control a n d Vision and one paper on o f a c e transfer with SS Control. So we will start with、uh, Sam, who will tell us about ACE from, for general policy from s t a n d a r d assumption. So please. So thank you for the introduction. So this is joint work with David.、Uh, so the topic of this talk is on access control encryption. So let me begin、uh, by motivating this notion. So, let's first、uh, consider the setting of a standard encryption scheme. So, in the setting, we have two parties, Alice and Bob,、uh, who have access to some shared secret key K. So, if Alice wants to send some message、uh, to Bob, then she would, of course, encrypt using this key K and send the side text over to Bob. And Bob would then decrypt using the same key.、Uh, so, this is a very basic uh, uh, notion of encryption that we all know and love, and we make a lot of uses for them. Let's, let's now consider the setting where there are many, many users in the system. Okay, and Alice wants to encrypt to some arbitrary subset of the user's index. Then, what Alice would need is to have、uh, some shared secret key with each user's i n d e x system. Okay, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, if she does, then she can just encrypt using the, each of the shared keys and, and she can broadcast out to arbitrary、uh, users in the system. Of course,、uh, this can、uh, be made、uh, correct and it can be made secure, but it, this is not ideal in that she has to、uh, maintain a large number of、uh, keys for each user's i n d e x system. Uh, so, to cope with these types of situations,、uh, many new no-、uh, advanced notions of encryption schemes have been proposed over the years, like identity based encryption, attribute based encryption, broadcast encryption, and so on.、Uh, so, all of these advanced、uh, encryption schemes、uh, fall under the general framework of functional encryption. So, it was formalized by Borne et al. in 2011.、Uh, so, in a functional encryption scheme,、uh, each user in the system are given decryption keys associated with some function f. And this function f、uh, specifies the precise、uh, information. That a decryptor is supposed to learn from a ciphertext. So if Alice encrypts using some global encryption key, then she can just broadcast out、uh, the ciphertext to all the users. And a user with a decryption key associated with some function f will learn the function f applied to the message and nothing else about the message. Okay, and since the access control is done at the decryption level, Alice just has to maintain、uh, some global encryption key that she can just encrypt. Uh, so, of course, functional encryption is a very big、uh, topic of research today, and what it basically allows us to do、uh, is to have a fine grained control of the decryption. Okay, so, it allows us to precisely control what information can be learned from the decryptors. So, a natural question that we can ask then is can we also have a fine grained control of encryption?、Uh, so, can we precisely control what information uh, a, sender can send, uh, uh, a, send, a sender can send, a sender can encrypt? So, this is a natural question, and Uh, it's applicable to many real world scenarios. Right? So,、uh, let's first let's just consider the setting of like, a company environment.、Right? Uh, the company can give、uh, its employees, its users, uh, uh, the ability to work with,、um, the authority to work with some private data of the company.、Okay? But uh, you, the, uh, the employees of the company are not allowed to publicly reveal this data. They come to the work, can come to the company and、uh, work with the private data, but not be able to bring this data home. Uh, so, in this type of scenario, we want some security against malicious senders.、Okay, we want to prevent an adversary who already has access to some private data、uh, to send some information out. And this, also, this type of security also makes sense because、uh, oftentimes、uh, information is sent out by mistake, or there can always be a virus who will,、um, that will、uh, randomly scrape random parts of the memory and just、uh, broadcast it out、uh, to an open channel. So, can we ha- define some、um, cryptographic primitive that will capture, that will address、uh, these types of scenarios? And this is, of course,、uh, clearly possible without some additional hardware measures, without some additional、uh, restraint on the model. And the question is,、uh, of course,、uh, if the adversary is, is, or who is already given some private information, if the adversary is given, also given access to some、uh, open channel, then there's nothing to prevent the adversary from just,、um, just, from just sending out to the open channel the private information in plain text. So, the question is, what is the right,、uh, the right model? And this is where access control encryption comes in, or ACE for short.、Uh, so, this is a notion that was introduced、uh, by Dan Bartetel、uh, in 2016. And basically, they introduced、uh, this, no- this、uh, entity called a sanitizer, where each ciphertext has to、um, 
where each ciphertext has to go through. Uh, so uh, each ciphertext that's encrypted by an encryptor is going to be processed pre is going to be processed by a sanitizer. Uh, so let me just describe this more in detail using diagrams. So uh, in the setting of access control encryption, there's going to be uh, two sets of users, uh, the encryptors and the decryptors, and each user in the system is going to be identified, but with some unique identity string. Okay, and of course for applications, uh, we, can uh, we can assume that uh, these two sets are overlapping, but for now let's just consider that they're disjoint. And for the whole system, we're going to have some fixed predicate pi that will basically take in a pair of identities, one from the encryptor and one from the decryptor, and basically output 0 or 1. So, so this predicate pi is basically specifying uh, who can send information to whom. So if uh, an encryptor uh, with some identity uh, is authorized to send some information to a decryptor with another identity, then these two identities should basically satisfy the predicate. And also we have a sanitizer in the middle who is uh, given some sanitizer key. And if an encryptor encrypts, uh, generates a side text, then this is going to be forwarded out uh, to the sanitizer. Uh, the sanitizer will basically pre uh, process, uh, do some operations on this uh, side text, and output some uh, new sanitized side text. And the sanitized side text will be broadcasted out to all the decryptors, and basically all the decryptors um, with the identity that basically satisfy the predicate in combination with the sender's identity should be able to decrypt uh, this message. Okay, and uh, the general goal uh, of access control encryption is to basically minimize uh, the amount of information that a sanitizer learns. Uh, so, it, of course, uh, if a sanitizer is, uh, uh, can, uh, is able to learn uh, the sender's identity or the obtained text, then it's actually quite easy to construct such protocols. Okay, just using uh, standard certification protocols or zero knowledge proofs and so on. Uh, but since uh, we want to minimize uh, the amount of information that the sanitizer learns, in particular we want to uh, hide the plain text and uh, the, the sender's identity, uh, this is not as trivial to construct. So how do we actually uh, define security in this model? So the original paper of Dan Gardetel uh, proposed uh, two security requirements. So the first uh, security uh, notion is called a no-read security. So in the setting, we basically assumed that all the encryptors, uh, the sanitizer, and all the decryptors are malicious, and they're all colluding with each other. And basically, we have one honest encryptor who is playing the role of a challenger, and if the encryptor uh, basically generates, uh, honest, on, uh, honestly generates some ciphertext, then uh, it should be uh, hard for an adversary to gain any information uh, on the ciphertext, as long as all the decryptors are not authorized uh, to, decrypt, uh, to decrypt this message. So this is basically equivalent of just standard semantic security. Uh, so the second property, uh, so the second security requirement is called no right security. And this basically captures the idea of kind of finally, uh, finally controlling uh, the encryption. So in the setting, we have all the encryptors and all the decryptors are dishonest. Uh, and only the sanitizer is basically honest. So the, the admissible uh, condition here is that no encryptors should be able to um, send information to any of the decryptors. <coughs> and basically the adversary's goal is to send some information through the sanitizer to get to the decryptor. So how do we actually capture uh, this notion formally? So we basically define some game where an, on, uh, the, <coughs> a malicious encryptor generates some maliciously, uh, malicious uh, ciphertext and sends it over to the sanitizer. And the sanitizer will basically flip a coin and it, it will either honestly sanitize the ciphertext using the, algorithm, using the real algorithm, or it will basically um, sample a random ciphertext from the ciphertext space. And we basically require uh, that a bounded adversary is not able to dis distinguish between uh, honestly sanitized ciphertext and a randomly sampled ciphertext. So this is the notion of no right security. And this is basically uh, the notion of access control equation. Right, so uh, what we know about is uh, constructions. Uh, so the original paper of uh, Dan Gardetel, who introduced the notion, gave two constructions. Uh, so the first one was based on DDH or DCR, and the downside of this construction was that the ciphertext size uh, grew exponentially with the size of the, of the identity strings. And so the second construction, uh, they basically get rid of this downside, uh, but they had to rely on strong assumption of indistinguishability of this case. So there were some follow-up works uh, to this. Uh, so Kush Power et al., 2017, uh, constructed access control encryption uh, where uh, you're just using a standard assumption of pairing groups of SXDH. And they were also able to get the ciphertext size that's very compact. 
but the downside of this construction was that the was that the family of predicates that the that the scheme can support was uh, restricted uh, to to basically equality and comparison predicates. And there was also work by Panatel, and the basic, uh, they basically cons uh, construct um, access control encryption for arbitrary predicates using LWE, but the sacrifice size was also very big. So in this work, we basically construct uh, access control encryption that uh, basically can support arbitrary predicates. The ciphertext size is also very compact, and uh, we only use standard assumptions of DDH, RSA, and LW. So we do have to uh, rely on all three of these, uh, DDH, RSA, and LW, uh, but I will talk more about this uh, later in the talk. Okay, so for the remainder of the talk, let me give a high-level overview of our construction. Uh, so we're basically going to uh, do a divide and conquer approach. We're just going to break down uh, the notion of access control encryption into different components and basically solve each of these components separately. So let's just consider, let's just first achieve uh, no read security. So let's just ignore uh, no read security or uh, just ignore Sacrex uh, components. So if it's just, just no read security, then it's actually quite easy to achieve. Uh, so we can basically just use a cert. So all the uh, encryptors uh, can be just be given a signature of their own identity string. And to encrypt, the encryptors can just attach uh, the signature uh, along uh, to the message and just send it off to the sanitizer. And the sanitizer can just verify the signature, and basically if it checks out, then it can encrypt to all the users in the system that are authorized to decrypt this message, or to decrypt this sanitizer. Right, so uh, I guess it's a little more clear in the diagram. So uh, in the setting, so all the encryptors are now going to be given uh, a, a, a signature of their own identity string, and all the decryptors are going to be given some unique uh, secret key for just a standard symmetric encryption scheme. Okay, and basically uh, to encrypt, the encryptor is just going to attach uh, its own identity and the signature uh, along to, uh, uh, to the message and just send it off to the sanitizer. The sanitizer just checks um, the signature and just encrypts to all the, use, all the decryptors in the system that are allowed to decrypt and concatenate all the ciphertext and just broadcast out uh, the ciphertext. So does this actually satisfy um, no write security? So in the no write security, we basically assume that all the encryptors are malicious and, um, and all the decryptors who are not authorized to decrypt are malicious. Uh, the security from, uh, against the encryptors just follows from the signature scheme. Right? So uh, the ciphertext is just attaching uh, the signature of their own identity uh, to the message. Uh, so, as as, so as long as the encryptors cannot forge, um, they cannot uh, produce uh, maliciously generated ciphertext. And the, and the security against the encryptors is followed from the definition of the sanitizer and the semantic security of the underlying encryption scheme. Right? So by definition, the sanitizer will only encrypt to, use, to decryptors who are authorized to decrypt. Uh, so by semantic security, uh, no information is lost, uh, is leaked uh, to the to the malicious decryptors. All right. So uh, so I guess uh, the downside of the previous construction of this construction is that the ciphertext size is very big. Right. The sanitizer is encrypting to all the users in the system that are uh, that are allowed to decrypt. So let's try to tackle uh, compact ciphertext next. Uh, so for this, a useful uh, um, tool that we use is uh, predicate encryption. So this was a notion uh, uh, formalized by Bonet and Waters in 2007. So this is just a, a more advanced encryption scheme uh, where the encryption algorithm takes in some attribute uh, and message pair. So the encryption algorithm takes in some attribute X and some message M pr and produces some ciphertext associated with X and M. And now the decryption keys are also associated with some function F. And the decryption uh, using the secret key associated with the function F and uh, on the ciphertext associated with the attribute X and M uh, and message M uh, should output the message M if and only if uh, the, the associated attribute X satisfies the function M. Okay, and basically the security property says uh, that the ciphertext associated with the attribute X and the message M should be hidden uh, to the adversary who is only given the, secret, uh, the predicate encryption secret key uh, for which F of X equals to zero. Okay, so this is just a standard notion of predicate encryption. So basically the idea is uh, we're going to allow, uh, make the sanitizer uh, when given the identity, the signature, and the message to just encrypt to the predicate encryption scheme okay, using the sender's identity as the attribute. Right? And the basically, uh, and the decryptors are now going to be given a predicate encryption, decryption keys, uh, that, will, that are associated with a function that just checks the, the fixed predicate pi 
uh, with their own identity uh, hardwired into the predicate. Okay, so, uh, so right now, so here, so here the decryptor is now going to be given a predicate encryption uh, decryption keys uh, with that will check the predicate that will check the predicate pi and uh, with their own identity string hardwired inside. And when the sanitizer receives uh, receives the identity, the, the signature, and the message, it will just check the signature and just encrypt using the predicate encryption scheme okay, using the sender's identity. And by, and, and then you will just broadcast out this predicate side. Of predicate encryption side and, of, and by correctness and security of the predicate encryption scheme, the no write security is maintained. But now the side flex size is very compact, right? Because the sanitizer is only encrypting to a single predicate encryption uh, side flex. All right. So our, the, the the final goal is to achieve uh, no re security. And basically, um, the problem right now is that the sanitizer is learning too much information. So the sanitizer, the current task of the sanitizer is to basically check the signature, uh, in which case it will learn the sender's identity, and it will and, and then to encrypt using a predicate, predicate encryption scheme, in which case it will learn the message. Right? So how can we actually uh, uh, make the sanitizer perform these tasks in a blindfolded way? And for this, we basically use uh, functional encryption. Uh, and functional encryption itself is a very powerful uh, primitive in its full generality uh, that only follows from obfuscation. Uh, but uh, we basically, uh, but in, in this setting, we can just rely on a bounded key functional encryption, which can be constructed from standard assumptions. Uh, so a bounded key functional encryption is just a standard functional encryption scheme where the security is only guaranteed when the adversary, when the adversary is only given a bounded number of keys. Right, so basically our idea is to just provide uh, this uh, function encryption secret key, uh, SK sub F, uh, where the function F is defined, uh, is basically going to simulate the task of the sanitizer. Okay, so you'll, th this function F will take in uh, an identity, a signature, and a message, and it will just check the signature, and if valid, then it will just output a predicate encryption sacrifice. Right, so now the sanitizer is going to be given uh, FE decryption key, SK sub F, and now the encryptor is just going to encrypt the triple, the identity signature and the message, using a functional encryption scheme. And the sanitizer, to sanitize the ciphertext, it will just run the FE of decryption uh, using, its, using its own key. And by definition, it will check the signature, and this will output some predicate encryption ciphertext. And this predicate encryption ciphertext will be broadcasted out uh, to all the users like before. So does this actually satisfy uh, no re security? So in OE security, remember, we basically assume that all everyone is basically dishonest, uh, except for a single encryptor. And if the honest encryptor uh, is uh, encrypting using a functional encryption scheme, by the security of functional encryption, uh, the adversary should only learn the function f applied to the underlying message. But by definition of the function f, uh, f applied to the identity of the signature and the message is basically the predicate encryption ciphertext. And by security of the predicate encryption ciphertext, uh, the adversary should not learn any information of, of the identity, of the attribute, or the message, uh, as long as no, none of the decryptors are authorized uh, to decrypt. Okay, so this is basically how we achieve uh, no we secure. And of course, uh, there's a number of security details that that, uh, that comes up uh, to to uh, argue security, and I'll just defer that up to the paper. Uh, one thing, uh, one important thing to note here is that. Uh, where basically the encryption algorithm, the predicate encryption algorithm, is a randomized operation, right? So, uh, so this actually violates the traditional uh, syntax of a functional encryption scheme. Uh, so we basically have to embed PRF keys everywhere. So we basically have to embed a PRF keys uh, as part of the message and also as part of the FD, uh, function associated with the FD key. Uh, and this also this makes it uh, this makes security a little bit harder to um, argue and a, a little bit um, cumbersome to argue about. Uh, so, but luckily for us, we based, uh, there are a number of works that actually uh, study functional encryption for randomized functionality. And basically, uh, these, construction, uh, these uh, works um, show that if you take uh, a regular functional encryption scheme for deterministic functionalities, then you can actually uh, boost that uh, to functional encryption that can support uh, randomized functionalities uh, using, uh, using the, if you just, if you just assume the DH and RSA. All right, so, oh, yeah, so this is basically the reason why we actually need all three assumptions, because uh, right now, uh, this boosting step, only, uh, we, only, we only know how to do this boosting step using deviation RSA, and predicate encryption, actually, just, uh, we only know how to do it from f of 3. 
All right. So uh, uh, additionally, we in the paper we uh, introduce or uh, we propose some additional uh, extensions to the AC definition. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, basically to support a dynamic policies. Uh, that's uh, pretty simple. To have a more fine grained control uh, of the sender policies and and, um, and to get beyond uh, all or nothing decryption. Uh, <laughs> But I will just refer to the details of this uh, in the paper. But basically, uh, with just simple modifications to our original construction, we can basically achieve all of these uh, extensions. Right. So let me conclude uh, with some uh, some open problems. So um, so like I said, uh, our construction basically relies on three different assumptions. So the uh, uh, so DDH, RSA, and LWE. So it'd be really nice if we can actually just rely on a single assumption. Uh, and that would be qualitatively much better, and that would be, uh, that would be really nice. Um, and I think it's actually doable. And uh, so another question, um, so access control encryption is a, is a very uh, new uh, topic, is a, new, very, is a very new uh, notion that was introduced. So um, there's a lot more work to be done on uh, connecting uh, this primitive uh, to other more advanced notions in like cryptography, like obfuscation, functional encryption, and predicate encryption, and so on. So I think there's a lot more uh, work to be done here. Okay, and with that, uh, I will finish my talk. Any questions? Thank you. We have time for questions. Sure. Um, yes, you can hear me probably. Yeah. Uh, oh, thanks. Um, so I, I probably blinked when you said where RSA is being used. That's that's one question. Uh, and the second one: Do you have do you um, must you use the generic uh, transformation for randomized functional encryption? I mean, in your case, it seems like an easier case because you just have one key, and perhaps like some other some other things, some other properties that uh, would make it easier to sort of just get it based on fewer assumptions. Um, yeah. So the first question. Yeah. So I, so to to get to boost uh, functional encryption uh, to ran to support randomized functionalities, I believe we need visits. And we basically, um, so, so yeah, so you basically have to use either pairings or RSA, uh, and we cannot get it from LWE. So that's the first, yeah, oh, so that's so why. DDH, DDH, so DDH, RSA. So you either need DDH plus RSA or pairings, okay. I believe. <laughs> yeah, so that's the first question. And the second question, yeah, I guess I guess that is possible, we, we, but we didn't really explore uh, that part. But yeah, so I guess, uh, yeah, so we just, so, so the security argument was, that are becoming much more complicated, so we just basically just rely on the randomized function function encryption. So, yeah, but then, but it might be possible to not use use it in full generality. So, yeah. Thanks. Further questions? Questions, comments? We still have some time. If not, then let's spend same again.